Welcome everyone to yet another virtual bourbon tasting for the Railbird Music Festival. I am the host of this uh, fun program once again. I'm Drew Franklin from Kentucky Sports Radio. Uh, this time we're joined by Four Roses Distillery. We'll be trying some of their products today and then eventually one will be picked to represent Railbird as a single barrel, single barrel pick. But first I'll uh, welcome everybody on. I'll start with the other regular, David Helmers. David, uh, how are you doing today? I'm great, Drew. How are you? It's good to see you again. You too. Uh, these are becoming a regular part of my life and I'm not mad about that. <laughs> it's become the best part of, of my work week and uh, we're especially excited today to have Four Roses here. Four Roses was a signature bourbon of the inaugural Railbird Music Festival. Uh, so they joined us in the Rick House, but then we're also kind of all over the, the festival grounds with their own activation. Uh, they're a, a, a very favorite of ours and uh, so we're excited to, uh, to taste some of their excellent products and uh, and learn a little bit more about their process. And yeah, we're excited. And another regular uh, who knows a little bit about bourbon, Justin Sloan from Justin's House of Bourbon. And it looks like in the same frame, we have Caroline Paulus also from Justin's House of Bourbon in the Bourbon Review. How are you all doing today? Good, Drew. Doing good. Good to see you guys again. Glad to have you. And we have uh, a friend of mine, Maria Montgomery, former Miss Kentucky and now a Ford model. Is that correct? That's all right. Only because you've taught me how to model. That's, that's correct. And to be clear, not Ford like F-150s. That's an agency. <laughs> right? uh, how Thanks well do you know me. bourbon, Maria? What'd you say? How well do you know bourbon? Um, I know that I like to drink it. All right. You're in the right <laughs> place. And we're also joined today by Silas House, a best-selling author of six novels from right here, Southeast Kentucky, I believe. Uh, Silas, you also dabble in some music writing. I believe you did the liner notes for Jason Isbell's new album. What else is going on in your busy world these days? I was just trying to finish a new book and uh, looking forward to drinking some whiskey. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> like you're ready for whiskey. Is, is it true there might be a reissue of some of uh, the first set of books? Yeah, my first three books are, are uh, coming out July 7th. They're uh, been repackaged with uh, nice covers and all that. And Tyler Childers wrote the uh, forward for one of them. So that's cool because he was at Railbird last, last year. All right, we'll be looking out for those. Glad to have you here. Thank you. Then, of course, from Four Roses, we have the master distiller, Brent Elliott. Uh, Brent, is it true that you were named master distiller of the year recently? Because that seems like quite an honor. Yeah, uh, that is true. This this past or this year, earlier this year, I was named um, the uh, American Master Distiller by Whiskey Magazine. So, yeah, it's quite an honor for all of us here at Four Roses to to have been recognized and honored with that award. Yeah, heck, we're honored just to be here with you, ready to drink some bourbon and learn a bit from you today. Uh, my understanding is we've got some uh, Four Roses we're going to go through here. You're just going to lead us on a guided tasting. I'm going to Hand it off to you briefly. Just kind of tell us what you have set up for us today. Okay, uh, what I have, I know in front of you, I think you all have the small batch and the single barrel. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the uniqueness of Four Roses and how we make these different products. And in doing that, I'm going to be talking about the different recipes. And that will segue into this tasting because with our barrel program, what we do is we offer at barrel strength and non-chill filtered up to all 10 of our different recipes, aged eight to 12 years. And that's what I have in front of me here. I have seven of the individual recipes that I'll taste through. And this is a first for me. I've never done this virtually. I do this a lot with people in person and they're tasting also. So we'll just kind of play this by ear. I'm thinking I'll go through, maybe jot down some notes, narrow it down to two or three that I really like. And then through the notes, maybe you guys can help me select the final barrel that we'll use for Railbird. How's that sound? Sounds like a lot of fun. And I also want to thank you because the samples came with some nice gifts, including four actual roses and a nice bottle here. I was impressed. I would this to the fiance when she asked why I smell like bourbon <laughs> at three o'clock on a weekday. Yeah, they're they're multi-purpose. When I'm finished here, these are going to go home to my wife too. So They're very pretty. <laughs> thank thank you, you so much for including that. Well, thanks for joining us here today. This is, this is exciting. Like I said, I've never done this before, but uh, I'd like to start off just by giving you guys a little bit of background of Four Roses. Um, we're actually an old brand. We go back uh, to the 1880s. We were trademarked in 1888 in Louisville, Kentucky. And 
the name Four Roses actually goes back to the legend it has to do with our founder, Paul Jones Jr. He was smitten by a lovely Southern belle and he proposed marriage to her multiple times and she wasn't giving him an answer. So finally he said, this is it, this is the final proposal, uh, you know, yes or no. She said, I will give you an answer at the upcoming grand ball. And at the ball, she arrived wearing a corsage with four red roses, which apparently in the Victorian language of the flowers signifies a yes. So with her saying yes and, and his excitement, he named his bourbon Four Roses. And it's been known as Four Roses since 1888. And we continue to sell Four Roses in the U.S. and internationally up to and actually through Prohibition all the way up to today. But there was a period uh, from the late 50s up until 2002 when Four Roses bourbon could only be found in Japan and Europe. And that was because our parent company, Seagram's at the time, uh, they decided to focus the, the, four, the bourbon, the liquid that was actually bourbon, in the international markets. And they wanted to switch what was in the U.S. market. They wanted to keep the name Four Roses, but they switched the liquid to a blended whiskey to help the inventory stretch farther and to meet the changing palates of consumers. So really, we are relatively new back into the United States as a straight bourbon whiskey. In 2002, we came back only in Kentucky, of course, because this is our, our home. And then we started adding more states starting in 2006, 2007. Now we're in all 50 states. We're still popular overseas, but really the exciting area, the, the, the growth and the, um, all the expansion we've done, everything that we're doing now is to maintain or keep up with the growth in sales here in the U.S. market. So it's a really exciting time for all of us here at Four Roses. And um, you know, now we get to go out and do things like partner with Railbird and do things that are sort of um, related to bourbon, related to all things Kentucky. And so this is a perfect relationship. So we're excited for this. Uh, next thing I wanna talk about before I go into the tasting here is uh, the 10 recipes that we use to create our bourbon. And the reason we make 10 recipes is because when you're making a product like bourbon, part of the magic is that you can't control every aspect of the production. You are at the mercy of the, the grains, the weather, the wood. There's so many different variables that go into the final flavor of any individual barrel that we need some way to be able to control that. So what we do is we create 10 different recipes, and I think you got a tasting card. Does everyone have one of these? This kind of explains what I'm about to talk about. So the way we produce these 10 recipes is we start out with two distinct mash bills, both very high in rye. One is 20% rye, the other is 35% rye. And then on each of those mash bills, we will ferment with one of five different yeast strains. And those are all listed here. Each yeast strain creates different flavors through the fermentation. We have a delicate fruity yeast strain, a rich fruity yeast strain, spicy, one's kind of floral, one's kind of herbal. Uh, what's important to understand is with two mash bills and the five yeast strains, that's how we arrive at 10 different recipes. And then we use these recipes in different combinations, one for consistency within our existing products. And the other way is to create unique and different products. So for example, the small batch that we're going to taste, this uses four of our recipes. This particular single barrel, our standard 100 proof single barrel, uses one recipe. The Four Roses bourbon that you don't have in front of you, that has up to all 10 recipes. So every one of our products, regardless of proof or age, is going to be absolutely unique, unique just because of the different recipes that we use in each one of these. So has everybody got that? Got it. Got that. Clear. I do want to point out to you, David, I noticed, for those of us that followed these before, David and I share uh, the notes we smell here. They've listed some examples here, so we're going to have a hard time straying away from that. That's right. We're very susceptible to influence. So uh, we, we're becoming expert in this, but when people say, oh, I, I get a little bit of citrus there, a little bit of vanilla, Drew and I just nod our heads and, and you know, quickly <laughs> agree. So uh, we're getting a little bit better, but uh, <clears throat> we're, we're, we're subject to a, a lot of uh, suggestion. Oh. Everyone is. In fact, like if we're doing evaluations in the Century Lab, it's taboo to start spouting out any kind of descriptors before everyone looks at them. Because no matter how professional you think you are, how seasoned you are tasting and, and evaluating bourbons, if somebody says raspberry, you're going you're gonna to taste it. Or vanilla or whatever it might be. If there's any hint of it in there, people will tend to, it will skew your perception and you'll see it. Everyone is susceptible to that same 
that same suggestion, that same power. Under suggestion. the influence, I guess you could say. <clears throat> as long as it's good, sounds good to me. You guys ready to start tasting these? Do it. Sure. Ready. Okay. Well, we're going to start out here with our small batch. This is, as I mentioned, four of our recipes. It utilizes both mash bills, the high rye and the lower rye mash bill. And then it utilizes the cake yeast, which creates a spicy flavor and aroma, and the O yeast, which is very rich and fruity. So with this, it's a combination of six and seven year old barrels. It's 90 proof. And the way I see this, and again, I don't want to influence what you're tasting, but what you should look for here is that balance between the fruit and the spice. And you'll see that in any of our products. It's all about having the balance, whether you're you don't want to be too far in one direction. You want to be layered, complex, and most importantly, balanced. So Brent, you guys were nice enough to give us pads of paper and our own like Four Roses pens. So uh -huh. as, we're, as we're nosing this without influencing each other, we can jot down uh, you know, those things that we, uh, we sense, right? Absolutely. I love when, when people come in the store and ask, ask uh, uh, say, hey, you know, I'm kind of new to bourbon. I want something something to, to, to get into it. I, I always pull this off the shelf and say, this is the gateway bourbon. This is one that everybody will love. They're, this has got something for everybody, and it'll uh, get you going down a dark, deep rabbit hole of, of finding, finding other uh, uh, products. And then, you, then you move them to the single barrel, and it's, uh, their mind's blown. So. <laughs> I appreciate it, Justin. Yeah. I feel the same way. I think it's so versatile. It's, yeah, it is. If I'm meeting someone that isn't really that familiar with bourbon or thinks they don't like bourbon or – you know, they saw that perception that bourbon is going to be hot and, and harsh. This is the one that I'll introduce them to because it is so mellow, so easy to drink. It's a good cocktail, neat on the rocks. However, it's just a good, an excellent all-around bourbon. Everybody so jotting down your notes out there? Silas moved in the neighborhood not too long ago, and so when I – uh, I knew we were doing these tastings. I wrote him and I said, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna do some of these. Would you like to join us?" And I mentioned Four Roses, and he was like, Four Roses is one of my favorites." So um, I'm glad. Yeah, when I wasn't uh, listening to music at Real Bird last year, I was in the Four Roses tent the whole time. So. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, thanks, Alice. I love your book too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, how about? Does anyone want to share any other notes? On the nose, um, I do get a little bit of bubble gum in addition to the, the fruit and the spice. Okay. It's something very classic, double bubble kind of thing. I'm agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> I kind yeah, of like the like double bubble. Someone says it and you'll taste it. Yeah, I get that. I get that sometimes um, in any of our bourbons, I'll get sort of a, a juicy fruit or a bubble gum type flavor. Not always, but sometimes if someone suggests it, I'll probably see it. Yeah, what so, about like a honey, like a flavor in it? Absolutely. I think honey is one of those flavors that is really common. Maybe not as common as caramel and vanilla, which you can find in just about any bourbon. Um, but honey is up there. I think that's a really common note uh, because of that sweetness of the, the barrel and all the different barrel influences, I think a lot of times that's how it's perceived is, is honey. And sometimes- I think a lot of that honey, honey also comes from that, that kind of the mid palate, uh, you know, that mid palate kind of the, when you, when you get a little taste of honey, it's kind of that, it's a, not, not like it's sweet, but it's also got this little tiny hint of like floral spice to it. And it's a, uh, uh, that's what, when, it, when you get a good honey, that's, that's what you get with, uh, with this as well. Yeah, it's a, it seems to be a light sweetness. When Maria Maria said that, you know, I, of course, then I recognized it. But um, but it's uh, it's sweet, but it's 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 very light. And I think florals is the right word, but kind of sugary, but not a not a caramel deeper sweet flavor. It really smells good. It does. I agree. Any other comments on this one before we move on to single barrel? I, w I would add to it, but my brain would say uh, double bubble honey and a little bit of floral. So maybe I'll lead off. On well, I know this is a, a probably a really common note, but it's just that that oakiness really rises to the top. I I love that aspect of it. 
Insanity. And you were saying earlier how people are sometimes afraid of bourbon being too hot, you know, but I like how this has that uh, cinnamon to it, but it's not overpowering. It's not too hot, you know, but it's definitely there. And it's, that's especially good for me on the uh, finish, I think. And it makes that finish just last and last. Yes. Yeah. All that rye spice in there just keeps going. Yeah. So is that the higher the rye, the the longer the finish? Is that the, the correlation? Uh, not necessarily, but I think with this one and this one, a lot of that finish, the perception you got on the finish, that that rye spice, that that vibrant characteristic, I think that really does contribute to the uh, the finish in these. So, but I've had a lot of wheat-based bourbons that have super long finishes also. So I'd hate to say that just the rye contributes, but it can. And I think it does in, in these two products. Gotcha. That makes sense. It really gives it, the rye gives it that, a lot of times you say spice, people, if they already have the perception that bourbon's going to be hot, kind of like what you're saying, Silas, it's, it's not, um, it's not heat, it's not harsh, but it is more like the baking spices, the cinnamons, the nutmegs, some of those that, when you call them spice, people might associate that with heat, but they're more like the, the nuanced baking spices, like I mentioned. And I think that's really that and the, the structure and just the pure rye flavor that the uh, higher rye imparts. I think that's really what defines these and really all of our products because everything we have, the lowest rye mash bill is at 20%. And that's still higher than most other bourbons you're gonna find on the market. And our high rye mash bill is as high as you're gonna find. 15% more rye or 16% more rye than it would be a rye whiskey. Brent, is the is the small batch a ninety proof? Yes. Okay. So, um, and that it also makes it. I mean, some of the bourbons we've been tasting, you know, are are at barrel strength and are are. And this is a nice drinkable proof. It's not it, it's not too hot for that reason either. Yeah, very approachable. It's another reason why people that maybe aren't that familiar with bourbon or know what they like. Another reason this one's very approachable, it's not a barrel strength. It's not so high in proof that it's going to turn people off the minute they try it if they're not familiar with bourbon. So it's just the perfect you know, go-to bourbon for. I think for the caramel helps with that too. I think it makes it feel smoother and the, the sweetness, of course. So I think it helps it go down really smooth. I'm glad you all like it. I feel the same way. It's hard not to, I'm pretty sure. I'm becoming a bourbon pro over here, so. <laughs> Have you been involved in all these tastings too? Or Have I? No, no, this is, this is number one. So I'm good friends with, with David and, and with Drew and Justin. And so I helped some with Real Bird last year and this is first. So anytime you want a day drink, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> right, this, this, as we go on this, this the, the number of windows is just gonna have to grow and grow because everyone's like, well, I'm, I'm <laughs> Next week, yeah, I'm yeah, next week yeah. and uh, there'll be 18 of us on here. <laughs> Even after this, if you all just want to call me one night and drink bourbon, I, I'm down. Whatever you give me to use tonight. We don't have to film it. We don't have strict stipulations here. Yeah. Just if we only knew somebody who had a whole lot of bourbon to share, so we could just do this after the picks were up. <laughs> we'll figure it out. <laughs> I think I know a guy. I don't know. Hopefully next year we can do this properly. We can all do this in person at Four Roses, sample straight from the barrel. Uh, since you mentioned that, I toured uh, Four Roses a couple of years ago with Justin Sloan, and it's a beautiful place. But did you all do some expansion in the last couple of years as well? Yeah, we did. We just completed a um, huge expansion project last year. And the growth I was talking about here in the U.S., it was all just to meet that demand. We've seen so much growth in the U.S. that we had to double our capacity here at the distillery. Wow. We've added yeah, one new warehouse, very, about yeah. two more. So a lot of growth. I invite all of you to come out anytime to, to take a tour. Let me know if you're coming, and I'll be happy to show you around. Well, thank you. That'd be awesome. It is a great tour. And when we came last year, when we did the, we did the barrel pick in person there, uh, we went to a separate separate building just for the barrel pick. Is that still where, where that process is, is going on? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's I not know. going on today or this week, but 
when we resume, that, that's exactly where we do the barrel pick. Yeah. Same interest when we roll the barrels out, pull, pull the samples out for sample thief or copper thief, and then we taste the samples and talk about it. All right, guys, we'll be there at uh, 10 a.m. tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> It's a, uh, it's a great, op I mean, it's, it's really a neat experience to go to Four Roses to see the facility. And then also, if you're ever lucky enough to be involved in an in a in-person barrel pick, to go in there and, and uh, you know, hang out in that room and do what we're doing right now, but just to do it on site and, uh, and pick that barrel is, is a lot of fun. <clears throat> okay, how about now let's segue to the single barrel. And this is... Um, a good lead into what we're going to do here because it's really the same concept in that what we're going to be selecting is one individual barrel and that's the same thing that this is a single barrel you know there's no legal definition for small batch but a single barrel is what it is everything in this bottle came from one particular barrel now this barrel is part of our standard lineup it's 100 proof it's always the same recipe so of the 10 recipes this is always the high rye mash bill you can find out here is the OBSV. So 35% rye mash bill with our V's. So you get a lot of spice from the rye and you get delicate fruits from the V. So it's similar to, you know, I kept talking about balance for the small batch. Same thing here, we're trying to balance the spice and the fruit, but the spice here comes primarily from the rye and the fruit on this one comes from the yeast strain. It creates a little bit lighter of a fruity impression. Not so much as this one was more of the red berries, um, ripe apple, uh, maraschino cherry. This is more like pear, apricot, even sometimes um, green or red apple. But it's just a little more subtle in its fruitiness. So the same thing here, a balance between the fruit and the spice. This is aged a little bit longer. This is a minimum of seven years and it's a little bit higher proof. This is 100 proof. So I love uh, this. Start, you want to go ahead and sample this. Such a good uh, expression for you guys. It's on shelf every day. It's, uh, it's another good one that that people, when they want something a little more, a little more bite to it than uh, than the small batch, this is what we go to. And this is such a good uh, representation of what a single barrel can be, and uh, at a very generous price point too. When someone comes in and they're looking for something giftable for someone that just drinks casually, I mean, it's a beautiful bottle that's that step up, you know, for somebody that's ready to start taking it a little more seriously. Mm. So I, don't, I don't keep many bourbons at home, usually just about four or five bottles. But when people come over, that's usually one of the options that are out. For, I almost always have a bottle of this around. So good. That's what I was going to say. This is, uh, this is always out on our bar at home. We have, you know, just four or five bottles we keep out. And this one always makes the people who ask for bourbon are always happy when you, there you go. have this. I think it's a good option because it is a little spicier um, in comparison. So for people who don't want the sweetness as much, that is a good alternative to have. And for the um, proof, it's it still is crazy smooth. So mm -hmm. oh, look right. it's the same thing that it's 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 spicier. It's got a little more heat. Some of that's the the proof, but it 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 mellows nicely and it has a really nice uh, warm finish. But, uh, but it's not overbearing at all. It's not harsh at all. It's, uh, it's really good. So I want to make sure I understand. So this, the single barrel are all the OBSV recipe. Correct. For this one. So if you see the single barrel without the metallic label, that's 100 proof. That's always going to be the same recipe. Okay. Okay. And that was selected a long time ago, before my time. That was the recipe that was selected. Because at that age, between seven and nine years, it's really at its sweet spot in maturation. It's, uh, right. Because they're single barrels, you know, we, we've talked about this some as we're kind of drinking bourbon and, and, and getting educated. Um, you know, there, there are barrels that can be the same recipe in the same Rick house, the same date, you know, the same age. Uh, but then what comes out of that barrel, um, you know, will be unique. So if, if you're buying a single barrel, uh, four roses off the shelf, you know, you're going to get some some variation from from bottle to bottle uh, and barrel to barrel, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I was talking a lot about consistency earlier, and that's really the goal in most of our products. With single barrel, we can't really control that. We can select barrels that are not way out in left field or way off flavor profile, but it's understood by the consumer and us that 
each barrel is going to be different. And that's part of the charm of the single barrel program. You're absolutely right. Well, we definitely, you know, with, with Railbird, with these selects that we're doing where we're picking barrels, you know, every, every one is going to be uh, there that year. And then, you know, those, those bottles are gone and, and, and they're, they're gone forever. So, uh, so that's kind of part of our, our process too, with having all the Rickhouse uh, selects for Railbird being uh, single barrel bottles. So they're, they're unique and they're gone just like our lineup every year. <laughs> I think that makes it more unique and more special for sure. It, it adds to the experience knowing that it, it is just that single barrel. So I think that's a, that's a, definitely a bonus in my eyes. Well, this one's great. Um, I, uh, I really like it. Mm -hmm. Any other comments on that? I'm glad you all like it. I can't believe the proof for, with how smooth that it, that it is. So especially for people who I, I have always loved bourbon, even before I drank that much. <laughs> I liked bourbon. Um, maybe that's the Kentucky girl in me, but um, I think it's a, like you said, it's a great um, way to show people that it doesn't have to completely sting and burn all the way down for it to have such a high proof to it, that it still can be very, very smooth and, and easy to go down even with the high proof. Someone already said this, I believe it was Caroline, but I really like the, Packaging and presentation of the bottle, too. Yeah, this little leather guy. Pretty impressed with this. <laughs> Good. That's a nice touch, isn't it? Yeah, I like it. This one has, you know, a similar, like, long um, rye spice finish to it, but I also get a little bit of black tea, a little bit more complexity. And with the single barrel, you know, you'll find those little tiny things in each one. I, I was just going to say that, to me, it's like it tastes like Kentucky, you know? <laughs> there we go. I think, I think part of that for me is, and I mean, I don't know where this is coming from. Um, you, you'll probably be able to, to tell us as the master distiller, but I, I grew up working in tobacco. And so there's some kind of, I don't know, there's some note of that that I can't quite place, but it just reminds me of that. It all, every time I drink it, it takes me back working in tobacco. Do you know what that would be or? Uh, I sometimes get notes that remind me of sometimes tobacco, sometimes pipe tobacco, like the different um, more nuanced flavors of the, like the peach, the pear, some of those really kind of exotic, but out of place fruity notes that you smell in pipe tobacco. Sometimes I get those right. samples and that's reminiscent of um, tobacco. And sometimes I think that char, when you yeah. get a little bit of that smoke that comes through and just the tannins from the wood, that can sometimes give you that kind of impression. But I think it's interesting that you say that because that's part of what um, I enjoy. I think a lot of people enjoy about not just bourbon, but any drink in particular uh, or anything you smell, just how closely related memories are to taste and smell. And so you can taste a bourbon and leave it to the writer say it tastes like Kentucky. But that's, that's it. I mean, it really invokes these images that, that run deep and I think it's part of what makes something you can say, well, it's just a drink. Well, it is, but it comes with a lot of baggage and it's yeah. good baggage. It's, it's memories and, and these other associations that you make. Right. Just like Kentucky girls. So you have the, you have the sweetness and then you have a little <laughs> bit of the spice <laughs> together. <laughs> Uh, you said that it, I mean, I think, again, I know I'm very susceptible and impressionable, but, um, when you said that I immediately, I was, I was just finishing tasting a sip and I very much, you know, resonated with me that, that tobacco flavor. And I've heard people talk about that when sipping whiskey before, but uh, I grew up in Western Kentucky, tobacco fields and tobacco warehouses all over uh, the town I grew up in. And, uh, all my friends worked tobacco and, um, we played in, <laughs> in tobacco barns and tobacco fields and everyone I knew smoked. So um, it, when I took that sip, it was just like, and you said that, I just imagined the wafting tobacco smoke and, and uh, you're right, it, it tastes like Kentucky. I don't want to get away from the, the Kentucky talk, but I get a little bit of chocolate in there too. Mm. I could be crazy, but I got some of that. Well, chocolate. Yeah, maybe not. No, it's not crazy. All that's actually... Look on the back of your sheet. That's one of the official tasting notes. These notes are just guidelines. Again, 
you're looking for any of these, you can probably find them in there. But cocoa is is really a pretty common flavor that you're going to find in our single barrel. That, that finish is delicately long too. Um, <laughs> just, I mean, it just lingers. Good reading, Sloan. <laughs> 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 I also noticed ripe plum cherry <laughs> and a robust flavor. I'm mad that I finally oh, I and I say a note and then Coco is listed right there. And I'm, <laughs> no, I'm, done. I'm just copying off everyone. Don't get credit. That's all right, buddy. It's all right. <laughs> I'll be more specific. I get uh, Hershey's dark chocolate. <laughs> there you go. 70 or 80 percent. What are we talking about? <laughs> okay, this is too much. <laughs> Uh, well, that's a great foundation for us, Brent. What, what are we doing next other than just continuing to sip these two great uh, bourbons? Okay, so this was, like I said, a single barrel. Off the same platform, we started our private barrel program, which is bottom of the same bottle, but has the metallic front label, and it's selected by consumers, retailers. And what we do is we roll out up to all 10 recipes, whatever we have on hand in inventory, between 8 and 12 years old. And the retailer, restaurant, the, the customer can select which barrel they want. And then we bottle it for them, put it in a bottle with the metallic label, a side label that uh, indicates the recipe, the age, and usually the account information or whatever they like to put on. And so that's really what we're doing today is we're pretending like we were back to the warehouse and we rolled the barrels out. We're skipping all of that. Um, we're skipping straight ahead to the samples that I have in front of me here. But these are the same samples that are in the program, the same samples that would be rolling out if we were all in person today. Uh, the only problem is I'll be the only one tasting them. I'm gonna go through all seven of these, give them a quick nose and a taste, uh, talk about some of the notes, pick my favorite two or three, and then we'll decide on, on which one we'll, we'll select for Railbird. How's that sound? Sounds great, let's do it. Okay, the first one I start with here, and these are all barrel strength, just the way they're gonna be bottled. So they could range anywhere from the first tier to the sixth tier. So the proof could go anywhere from roughly 105 proof up to potentially 130. So there's a big range there. The first one, I know what this is, I just looked at it, it's a KE strength, but I'm still getting some, some hints of fruit, kind of reminiscent of the V, but um, spice. Even though it's the low rye mash bill, I'm getting the spice probably from the K because it's a lot of uh, nutmeg and maybe a little bit of cinnamon. It's a third tier barrel, so it's probably about 115 in proof. And super mellow. The, the palate is really kind of the same as what I described on the nose. Now for 115 proof or whatever it is, super mellow, super balanced. Uh, nothing really sticks out. It's not overly fruity. It's not overly spicy, herbal. It's really just a, a good all around, like center mass burn. That's a really good sample. And that's from 2010, so it's just now 10 years old, or turned 10 in March. So I don't know if we'll write all these down and taste at the same time. We don't want to. Is this, is this uh, OESK? Is that what you said? What was that? OESK? OESK on that one. On this one, immediately I get more rye. Rye fruit and some more oak. That actually has more oak than the last one, even though it's a year younger. This is an OBSV. It's rye, oak. It's very vibrant. This one really kind of explodes onto my palate. Whereas this one kind of came in smooth and even and just sort of transitioned to a nice, long, even finish. This one just a lot more impact on this one. Very vibrant, very bright. And it's, oh, that it's fifth tier, so it's a higher proof. So that will also give it some more of that, that uh, robust character, that higher alcohol percent. Uh, Drew, we can just keep tasting this single barrel and listen Thank to what you. he's saying, and they'll all be different. Yeah. I, ask, I feel empty-handed, so I'm just going to keep keep going. I was going to say, I, I like the part where we got to 
to drink. <laughs> <laughs> While I'm doing this, it's, it's kind of awkward to be drinking alone. So go ahead and read this. <laughs> You're doing a great job. It's very informative. Please, just read <laughs> Impressions. Um. And we'll, we'll test what I was saying. Every note that I make on all these, look for it when you're tasting. Whatever I say, you'll probably see it. Probably not as intensely as I'm seeing in some of these, but. Okay, this one I'm getting, um, it's candied. This one, I get sort of the juicy fruit that I was talking about earlier. Um, some vanilla. This gives me sort of a candied, like candied taffy impression. And same on the, yeah, it's a Q, high rye with a QE strain. That's what I'm kind of getting. It's a, it's a B mash bill, so it's high rye. It's kind of strange because it's not as sweet as the the nose would would lead you to believe. It's a little dry, but it's it's nice. That 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 fruit, that floral characteristic, that candy um, flavor is. It's a little dry. It's, it's unique. I like that one. And it's a uh, it's a second here, so it's lower in proof. It's probably about 110. And it's also it's the oldest one that we looked at so far. But the oak is really overpowered. It's there, and I think that lends some. Brett, age range. Or when you say the oldest, are we talking about 12 years old? Yeah, that's typically the oldest you'll see. Occasionally, if one is selected at the end of being 12, it might get bottled when it's 13, but we typically try to keep them eight to 12 years of age in the program. So that's really just the oldest of the three that we've looked at so far. And I don't want to mislead you, that finish still has a little bit of sweetness to it. It's just that that extra oak, it's kind of oaky with a hint of sweetness, but it it works very well with that, that uh, E string. Okay, so this next one. Oh, that's nice. It's, a lot of really light, delicate, fruity notes. Not too much oak. Might be because I'm coming off this one too quickly, but not much oak. Honey, I'm getting some honey in this. Maybe even a hint of honeysuckle. Mm, and just a little bit of oak on the top. Very chewy, some caramel, vanilla. And just a lot of nice nondescript fruit kind of in the background. That sweetness with maybe light berries, um, a little bit of apricot, and that's um, <laughs> actually this is pretty old too. This is ten years and uh, almost ten and a half years old. This is OESV first tier, so this is going to be again probably about 110 proof. That's, I really like that one. That's no surprise. I've really been enjoying the OESB in some of the more recent barrel selections I've done. And historically, the OESB has always been good, but it's always middle of the road, um, not overly robust, not overly spicy, not overly fruity. But I don't know if it's just my palate or the batches here lately, but I've really been enjoying the OESBs um, more consistently than I have in the past. Like I've been selecting it a lot over OESK, which I thought you asked me a year ago and said that's probably my go-to recipe, but lately OESV has been really impressing me. Okay, this next one I'm gonna look at is an OESQ. That's the lower I match bill with the fruity yeast. It's a fourth tier and it is it'll turn 10 later this year. So it'll be nine years old in this bottle. Getting a similar dose to the other Q, just a little bit more spice which makes sense. Actually, it doesn't make sense because it's uh, it's lower rye, but I'm still getting more, a lot more rye spice in this one, probably because it's younger and the oak isn't so dominant. It's always hard to do the process of elimination when you're looking at so many good samples. So what I've done is Comparing those two cues so I can kick one out. Between the two cues, I would prefer this one. It's lower rye. I'm getting a little bit more sweetness to kind of supplement that fruitiness that I'm getting here. I think there's synergy between that the extra amount of corn 
and that pure yeast and that candied flavor that I'm getting from this one. So that's very nice. Okay, two more to go. Everybody good keeping up? Trying. Keep it up. We need a drink every time you do. I think that's the goal. <laughs> okay. So this one, I'm getting rye and I'm, rye, vanilla, kind of, well, let me taste it. I know what this recipe is, but, okay, now that I'm tasting it, I know, or it's, it's clear what it is. On the nose, I wasn't getting too much of the F characteristic, which is usually mint or herbal. But as soon as it hits my palate, it's apparent because something about this F yeast strain, I know we were talking about finish earlier, uh, but I think for finish, the V and the F are really the two that have the most uh, viscosity, the, the ability to linger on your palate. And that's exactly what this one does. As soon as it hits my palate, it coats my palate, overtakes, it just washes over my taste buds, and it just hangs on. This is actually it's a nine-year-old bourbon, third tier, high rye mash with the F yeast. Very nice. Okay, the last one is OESF. So same yeast strain, different mash bill. So I expect a little less spice, maybe a little bit sweeter. That's that's the oldest one out here. And that's very very nice. That's from 08, so it's uh, it's over 12 years, almost 12 and a half years old now. Strangely enough, though, even though it's the oldest one, the oak is in check way more than the one that maybe it was. It's one of these back here that the oak is really dominating. This it really is. It melds well with the other flavors and the flavors in this. Are, it's kind of that mintiness, it's that, that rich mouth coating, um, caramel, vanilla, you know, the typical flavors you're gonna get. They work very well with that FE strain and very well with the oak for that age. Brent, the F and the VE strains are the two that you focused on for the new small batch select, correct? Yeah, absolutely. That's, um, and if you've tried that, and I know you have, part of the, I think the defining characteristic of that is the finish and just the mouthfeel. And a lot of that was by design because taking that F and that V together, not only do you get that extra long finish and extra mouthfeel, but you get the unique flavor when you take that V. So tickly and long, it's fantastic, yeah. Okay, so this is kind of tough. I think the three that I'm gonna narrow it down to will be, the OESK, I think that is just fantastic. And it's, again, it is 10 years old, third tier, just very balanced, very uh, like the, like a quiet hero. It's so good, but it's not, it doesn't really leave any huge impact on it. It's just very mellow, very balanced. Second time through, though, some of those barrel notes, the hint of sweetness, really come to the forefront with some of that, that spice again. I guess the lower I match, so the spice I'm getting from this is more like a little hint of cinnamon, um, maybe some nutmeg. I think the other one, um, I'll go with OESV. That is uh, 10 years, first tier. That one was the, my description on it is delicate fruit, um, a lot of complex fruit kind of playing at a low volume, intermixed with a um, little bit of rye, a little bit of oak, just balanced, complex, very interesting. Just a lot of layers to this one. And then the last one is this older one. I was really impressed with this. Um, probably not as complex maybe as this one, or probably not even this one, but a very unique flavor going on with this. Of that F-E strain, with that mint herbal characteristic coming in with that. It's a lot of oak, but it's not a stringent oak. At 12 years of age, again, I'm surprised it's so so mellow and not overly oaky, but it's... That's just very nice. 
And right. what's, that, what's that recipe, the third? OESF. Okay. So of the three I've selected, they're actually all three, that's kind of strange, all three, the low rye mash bill, OE. And the first one is the K, which is nice and spicy, sweet and spice. The V, which is uh, the delicate fruit, a lot of delicate fruit going on in this one. And the F, which on the palate, this is probably, these two are kind of subtle. This one has a lot of impact. It, it comes, hits your palate, it's like high volume, a um, lot of flavor all at once. Maybe not as complex as these, but it, it really makes itself known immediately. Coach your palate, it has, it's just very vibrant, very, oh. very flavors. What's the tier on that last one? Fourth tier. Okay. So at that age, fourth tier, that's probably up in you know, the mid 120s. I'm so sold. 123, yep. 127. <laughs> Be there in 45 minutes. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, just a little sip. So one of those three, uh, it sounds, I mean, it seems like you winnowed it down to three. One of those three will be the Four Roses Railbird Select for 2020. Um, and and I've, I took down notes what you were saying, and obviously we can't, we're not tasting that right now, but um, maybe I can give you a little guidance just talking a little bit about, about Railbird and it may sway you. I mean, you know, we're it, because the adjectives that we use to describe railbird they may fit with 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 one of those samples that you're talking about we're talking about a special occasion at least for me and hopefully for everybody who who comes to railbird it's it's pure kentucky we've been socially distant for the last couple of months but this is you know about the spirit of togetherness and uh, inclusive and celebratory and so when you talked about you know high volume and vibrancy in that third um third sample there I thought, well, that sounds like it, it, it fits. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm going to kind of leave it to you. And, uh, and obviously, Justin and Caroline, you know, they're hearing more than, than I am when you're talking about the recipes because they're so much better, you know, trained and expert at this. But, uh, but you know, we're trying to match up a great Kentucky spirit with a, with a new and, and great Kentucky event. So um, I'm, I'm curious what everybody else thinks. And, and Brent, if one of those seems to be uh, a front runner based on what we're talking about, um, let us know. Okay. I, I always seem to default to OESK historically has been my favorite, favorite recipe kind of um, year after year, it seems like, but uh, OESF is, a, is, is starting to kind of overtake that anyways over the last, it seems probably the last year and a half, two years, more of the OESK that I've had, uh, or OESF I've had is, is kind of better than the OESK. But everything you described about that OESF uh, just reminded me of the of the, the specialness and, and everything that uh, kind of embodies Real Bird too. So, um, and the way you were, it seemed like you described the, 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 the last one there uh, more, than, more than the other ones. Uh, so I think I know your favorite, but uh, um, yeah, me sold on the seven. Uh, and for me, the F2, you know, Brad, the last time I was at Four Roses with you, um, tasting through all the recipes that you guys combined for the small batch select, the F was the one that stood out to me, um, the, to the two in there that you had, and, and I'm generally a higher eye girl, but this one, this OESF is really working um, from what you're saying about it. Everyone that knows a lot more about me uh, seems to know what they're talking about, so I, <laughs> hey. at least on behalf of my end, I, I defer to everyone else. <laughs> I have a feeling if Brett thinks it's good, I'll think it's good because he can dictate all those tiny little flavors way more than I can. But um, it seems it seems to be a winner. So we're all leaning towards the F, huh? Mm -hmm. You can't go wrong with any one of these. Again, I would say this one you're looking at mellow, balanced. This one, as you're talking about Railbird and, and maybe the idea behind it. I say this one is more like mellow and harmonious, complex. This one is more vibrant, more unique. Um, so each one, you can't go wrong with any one of these. You couldn't go wrong with any one of the seven, but of those three, it sounds like you guys are kind of leaning towards this. Any other comments? Well, what are you leaning towards? Um, I would. I don't want to complicate everything. <laughs> no, we're just fault to you. If you say seven is not it, fine. When I, when I start, when I start getting too much information and I sort of 
clear at all and just think, if I'm walking away right now, I'm going to go make a cocktail or not a cocktail, sit back and have a, a drink. I would probably take this one. But ask me 10 minutes from now, I might say this one. They're so close. They're all just, they're different. It comes down to personal opinion, personal taste. Even comes down to time of day. Now, I'd probably pick, if we'd done this two hours ago, this one because it's a little bit more mild and a little bit easier drinking, that probably would have been my choice. Um, so it's, we're splitting hairs at this point. And so I thought it was a good idea to kind of look at maybe what represented the, the ideals of, of Railbird and how we selected this. So... Well Silas, maybe you can weigh in. Uh, I mean, you, you're a Railbird attendee and a super fan. Uh, I mean, how would you describe Railbird? Because I'm, I'm in the eye of the hurricane. I, I have a skewed view. Um, but, and, and Maria, too. But you guys were both there last year. You kind of experienced it uh, from the patron side. Um, maybe you could throw out some adjectives, and maybe that'll help Brent a little bit. Well, I, I really latched on to when he said uh, harmonious. I thought that was uh, that would be a good connection there, you know. And I think I think that's the one he's leaning to there in the middle, maybe that he thought was harmonious. I don't know. I mean, I love that word. Yeah. I think, you know, when I, of course it conjures up music, um, but you're using uh, all kinds of words that conjure up railbird, right? You said vibrant and um, all that. So yeah. Or harmonious. I would go with harmonious. Harmonious. <laughs> I do think this one is the most harmonious. This is probably the most robust, harmonious. And I guess so, the so, thing oh, sorry. Go ahead, Brent. Oh, go ahead, please. When I, you know, when I think about Railbird, for me, it is, you know, inextricably linked with Keeneland. We had that first bourbon dinner there last year, and so that impact is, you know, the horses thundering past. Um, the loud music, everything like that. So I guess the last one rings a little bit more for me in the terms of, you know, fitting in with the festival, with the bourbon lineup that we have, you know, it's going to range from 93, 94 proof all the way up. And it would be cool to have that stand out, that big, bold one. Well, I think there's, it's kind of a double-edged sword because with coronavirus, obviously, it's, we're hoping that it will be almost the breakout of what the quarantine we've all been in and the separation that we've all experienced. And although I typically like a, um, a, a high rye, like as far as the, the mash bill goes, I think anything that um, you said, you know, uh, like the harmony of it, anything that can symbolize bringing people together is what Kentucky needs. And that is, exactly what Rillaburn needs to symbolize as we all break out of our closets and become social again. Well, Brent, the task is on you now, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's only so much direction we could give you. <clears throat> we were all in a group. We would we have a whiteboard and you see we we tally up the votes based on which uh, which sample everyone like. Uh, I think now under these circumstances, we've kind of switched gears and how we're looking at this. So how about we go around and we vote for either harmony or robust? Oh, that's tough because you want to be like the harmony of everyone coming together, <laughs> but robust, like I want to be robust and broke, break out of this quarantine, so. I know it's tough. I think we, we need to try it. No pressure. You can't go wrong with either one of these. This one is much. It's older. It's a higher tier, so it has more alcohol. It has more. It's great. It has a lot of layers. Um, this one's just a little more complex, a little bit more mellow. Um, again, with this one, if I had to look at some of the, the words that were thrown around, maybe to describe real work. Again, harmonious. Harmonious, maybe a little bit quieter. A little robust, maybe a little bit louder. Um, a little bit richer. A little bit. Uh, a little bit more impact on the palate. So do we want to do it that way? Are there? Sure. There, I think that makes here. sense. And, and, and I'll vote first. Uh, and you guys can follow my lead or totally disregard it. I don't want you to uh, vote other than your own conscience. But I'm going to say turn it up. Uh, we've, been, <laughs> we've been home for a while. I'm ready for some uh, excitement and some vibrancy. So I'm going to go with the high volume, robust, uh, vibrant choice but uh that's just okay. one 
Also, uh, also here for the OESF. Yep. OESF here. Mm -hmm. Both yeah. of you. Mine are, or Drew, or Go ahead, Drew. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I was really leaning towards Harmony, but I am completely stir crazy, and so <laughs> I am definitely leaning towards the robust. Robust. Okay. Uh, I'll go ahead. Robust. I'll Anybody make it. Uh, harmony, a little mellow, <laughs> mellow flavor in your life. I'll get on board with everybody else. Oh. Robust. Robust. I think at this point, my vote doesn't matter, but I will say <laughs> it would be very irresponsible of all of us to pick one if we don't get together at some point, maybe at Justin's okay. House of Bourbon, and at least try it so we're super sure. Do it. I know the decision needs to be made now, but I think it, it would be right, the right thing to do if at some point we all got together and tried it. But I, I will also join the robust crowd, even though I kind of liked where we were going with Harmony. The way Silas put that, uh, we have – a man who knows bourbon and a man who knows his words. So I like I like how you said uh, the harmony for real bird, but then also robust and breaking out of all this sounds good too. We we can leave that part to the musicians, and we'll do the robust part <laughs> in our break. We'll bring the party. They bring the music. <laughs> right. <laughs> that sounds good. Sounds like we've made also, a decision. Yeah. What do you think, Brett? Yeah, you couldn't go wrong with either one of those. I'm glad you helped me make the decision because really at this point it really was coming. To what we're looking for in the bourbon. They're both excellent. They're just different. And I think this really captures what we're feeling uh, Railbird needs this year, and that's robust and loud. I'm mm -hmm. robust, and it's not going to be ignored. This is – you're going to notice this bourbon when you take a sip of it. Right. Cheers, Cheers, everybody. We have the uh, – the this our signature bourbon partner, uh, Railbird Select. We made a selection, and – and we did it in a very unique way, Brent. So thanks very much for uh, for guiding us through that. Well, I want to thank you all for joining me today. This has been fantastic. And I look forward to seeing you guys either beforehand at Justin's House of Bourbon or at Railbird itself. Sounds yeah. great. Thank you all for having me. I appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Anyway, Cheers, you guys. You're all invited to come visit anytime. Cheers. Cheers. See you all next time. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. Thanks, David, for bringing us together. Thanks, Thank you, David. Uh,